namaste a uh, welcome professor adams and professor nandi uh, thank you so much for being part of uh, the ahimsa conversation series uh, so today we are going to talk about the civil declaration on violence which was a process initiated by unesco in the 1980s uh, which led to a declaration uh, and uh, dr nandi and dr adams were two of the key drafters of that declaration so in today's conversation we will explore uh, their experience of coming up with the ideas of of, of exploring the ideas of violence and nonviolence and we we'll learn about how and why this declaration said what it did which is that violence is not the dominating trait of the human species um so professor adams can i welcome you and request you to begin uh, maybe by uh, describing your earliest experiences of uh, the idea of nonviolence and how you came to be associated with the unesco initiative on this issue well first of all uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you and especially with ashish uh, because i we have not seen each other for Uh, a small lifetime, actually, I think, thirty years since we met, or thirty-five years maybe. Uh, by the way, we are now joined by my cat. Must <laughs> be part of the program. Hello, cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are not the star. <laughs> so, uh, my first experience with nonviolence came when I uh, began to be a protester against the Vietnam War. when i was at the university and uh, at first i thought the vietnam war was simply a, a mistake but uh, the more i became active the more i found out that it was really part and parcel of the culture of war of uh, my government like many other governments and uh, in becoming part of the protest movement i met people who were uh, very active with nonviolence um I'm trying to remember uh, uh the name of the person who was most famous who I met at that time but any in any case uh we were young people at the time protesting the war and we uh sought out the previous generations for their experience and those who had experience with nonviolence were among the most effective uh and most convincing for us uh then uh at that point uh, i was at the university studying uh, brain research and i decided to devote my studies to the brain mechanisms of aggression with the belief uh, it turns out i was wrong but with the belief at that time that uh in some way the brain mechanisms of aggression are responsible for war and and so forth So uh at the university I had the opportunity to begin working on the brain mechanisms of aggression and I pursued this with a laboratory for 25 years before I finally realized that the brain mechanisms of aggression have nothing to do with war and uh and uh injustice in fact soldiers are not aggressive they're afraid and the people who make wars the heads of state and the uh, generals they are they are not angry uh they are simply following their uh, their orders or making uh policies uh, for their profit in fact there was a general schwarzkopf who was the head of the american uh military attack on iraq in the first iraq war and he had temper tantrums and was too aggressive and at that time the american secretary of defense took a plane specifically to arabia to confront him and say if you do if you attack your colonels one more time you are fired because there is no place for anger in what we are doing so uh at that time also i began studies of 
great peace activists such as Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, and all of them said that their motivation that got them going for justice was righteous indignation. They became angry at the injustice that they saw. Anger is necessary for peace and it is not necessary for war. At that time, I was part of the International Society for Research on Aggression. And at one of their meetings, I met Santiago Genoves, a Mexican, Spanish and Mexican anthropologist who had been part of the UNESCO Declaration on Race. And Santiago told me it's time for a UNESCO statement on violence to say that violence is not part of our genetics. It's not part of our evolutionary heritage. It is an invention. And so I worked with Santiago and we proposed the statement to UNESCO. It was accepted by the uh, chairman of the uh, section on social science, Pierre de Senarclans, but it was vetoed by his superior. He was so upset that this plan was vetoed that he quit UNESCO. But uh, another colleague from the International Society for Research on Aggression named uh, uh, Martin Ramirez was able to convince the Spanish commission of UNESCO to sponsor a meeting. And so for that reason, the meeting was held in Spain. And that's how we got started with the Seville Statement. But uh, then uh, I think I should uh, explain uh, how Ashis Nandi became involved. I approached uh, a former, uh, uh, a, a former uh, assistant director general of the United Nations from Japan. Uh, I'm trying to remember his name. Something like Soed de Matako, may you remember Ashis. And he said he could not come, but he suggested someone named Ashis Nandi from India. But uh, we had to have money to bring him. So I was making telephone calls to foundations. They all said no, except once I called the foundation and I said, may I speak with the secretary? And the person said, no, the secretary is on vacation. I'm sorry. And I said, well, who are you? And he said, well, I'm Mr. X. I'm the chairman of the foundation. And I said, well, then I explained why we needed the civil statement and why we needed to invite people from Africa and India to come. And he said, look, I, I only fund research on epilepsy, nothing else. Pause. And I said, but if there is a nuclear war, who cares about epilepsy? He started to laugh. And he said, look, he said, I will give you some money, but on one condition that you never tell where it came from, because my foundation, the rules of my foundation is we only fund research on epilepsy. So we got money and that's the money that uh, brought Ashis to a civil hill. Another foundation promised money to bring a scientist from Africa. And I proposed a very well-known uh, a South African who would be very good. And they said, no, and we, we will propose. And every single person they proposed was white. I said, I am not going to represent Africa with your white men. Africa is black men. And so there was no African at Seville because we could not get money for that. But uh, at Seville, Ashis, and there were, there were uh, about 12 people at Seville and then some others by correspondence. And they met all day, but Ashis and Santiago and I, we met all night for several nights. And we worked through the night to propose a draft which was then worked on during the day by the other people. And that went on for two or three days. We didn't sleep for two or three days, you remember? Excellent. So Ashishna, would you like to add here your own, uh, both your childhood 
uh, experiences, uh, you know, where you were on the issue of what were your earliest recollections of uh, nonviolence and your interest in violence, and then your experience in Seville? Well, frankly speaking, I was brought up in an atmosphere of violence. And I was also astounded by the way my parents kept out of this environment. They were deeply disturbed, both by the World War, when I was very young then, I mean, in the early 40s, and both, particularly my mother, was very disturbed by the massive violence and later on by the <clears throat> discovery of the way in which entire communities were either annihilated or uprooted or in some way or other the, the, their livelihood and an entire habitat was destroyed. Uh, Ashishda, you are referring to the communal violence? No, that... I'm not. I'm okay. referring to the world war. Communal okay. violence came later. Okay. Came a few years later. Okay. This was also accompanied by a famine in Bengal, which was Mr. Winston Churchill's gift to India, because that year the costs were ex excellent. There was no dust of uh, of uh, uh, grain, rice and wheat, both. It was, uh, but uh, Churchill was afraid that the Nazis would invade England and therefore wanted to build a buffer stock. <laughs> that, uh, that meant that they purchased at, a, uh, at high prices the entire rice uh, production of the year. Wheat was not that important of grain in Bengal, in that part of the country. And this led to the death from famine of something like 3 million people. Oh my God. Later attempts have been made to whitewash this, but now a book, an entire book has come out by a physicist uh, on this. And uh, that is with us. My early memories are of people begging all over the place. All they asked for were the discarded water of boiled rice. They didn't have the courage to ask for rice itself because everybody was suffering from the feminists. But the discarded water, you know, the water in which you boil the rice, you know, that is, was enough for them. And that cry, I still remember, it haunts me still. And in this double geopardy, if I might call it so, the global war going on and its reflection in this famine, I think in some way, it was clearly a man-made famine. And it was obvious to others there also that it was, uh, it left me with a deep interest in, because none of the beggars, none of those dying on the footpaths of Calcutta ever rose in rebellion. Often they died in front of shops of sweet mix and restaurants. Nobody thought of giving them the uh, discarded food at the end of the day. Even not even that, because they themselves were unsure of what is they are going to face at home. So this, I, in this atmosphere of violence, and I would say to some extent institutionalized violence, uh, was, was, you know, kind of uh, uh, could be counterpoised against the fact that my both my parents were deeply and committed non-violent people. They felt that it was the Christian duty to help those suffering, those suffering from violence as well as from the famine. 
and they never lost this business. After a few years came the great genocidal violence between Hindus and Muslims when India and Pakistan were born as two independent republics. And that time too, my father was very active. And I remember he was twice shot at, not by the rioters, but by the police whom my father was uh, pleading with to stop the rioting. So the police, at that time, the police force has become, become communalized. The Hindu policemen supported the Hindus, the Muslim policemen supported the Muslims. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the, that particular constable got angry and uh, picked up his gun and shot, tried to shoot my father. Uh, he missed very narrowly, twice he tried that. Uh, and I could see that it, it, uh, this violence was spreading, violence was spreading like an influenza epidemic. And it was very disturbing to the entire family. My second brother uh, was very sensitive to it. He almost gave up eating, seeing that constant violence. So I was brought up in this environment and I was made sensitive to it quite early. And when I found that in Bengal, particularly in the, in the wake of the communal violence itself, there was deep suspicion of Gandhi because they, the Hindus felt that he was betraying the Hindus and the Muslims felt that he was not adequately supporting them. Um, they were, actually, the Muslims also felt that he was against Pakistan. He wanted an united India. And I saw this tension and this anger against Gandhi also along with adoration for him. Gandhi undertook a famous fast at Calcutta, stopped the Calcutta violence. Mountbatten, who was, the, who was the viceroy at that point of time, called it a one-man border force between Hindus and Muslims. And even when we went to Bengal villages, he always made it a point, being a Hindu, he always stayed with Muslim families both in uh, West Bengal, sorry, both in uh, East Bengal and in Bengal, because wherever the, in East, uh, East Bengal, the Muslims were the aggressors. They were the majority community. In West Bengal, Hindus were the aggressors and um, Muslims were the victims. So he stayed at the, with Muslims, um, in Belegar, I was not really a Muslim house, but yes, but in in, a Muslim, in, in Islam, that was his practice generally. And in uh, East Bengal, he stayed in houses of Muslims, the aggressive party, and they welcomed it open arms. Because even though other Muslims hated them or called them traitors. So I was born with violence, so to speak. I lived with violence, and I also found at that time, then the in the wake of the famine and the wake of the national movement, Bengal undertook. A Bengal threw up like mushrooms. So many revolutionary groups who were adored by the Bengalis and the intellectuals, and the intellectuals had turned leftist by that time, but the leftism which was actually not Marxism so much as Leninism. They were all dreaming of revolution and violent revolution at that. So violence was in the air, violence was adored, violence was glorified. There were attempts to revive old heroes who had died hundreds of years ago, Hindu heroes and Muslim heroes and so on and so forth. Violence was all around me. And in that violence, I saw those who fought the violence, they were outnumbered, but never gave up hope. They fought out to the best of their ability against that. 
And even though at that time, I was uh, attracted by the ideology of the left, I gradually recognized the futility of violence. Because I could see all around me that it did not help anybody. It was a, a big attempt to annihilate another community, which they knew they couldn't do, both sides. They had to learn to live together at some time or other. That nevertheless, violence continued for days. The toll was, the communal violence took a toll of one million, minimally. My uh, studies uh, gives me the impression that it was much more than that because many of the deaths were not directly reported and they were a part, but they were the part or a product of that violence. The sense that many elderly people died on the way, many young children died on the way. There were three or four epidemic breakouts amongst um, uh, migrants who were leaving one country and moving to the other. Uh, Pakistanis coming to India and Indians going to Pakistan so on and so forth. And this experience, uh, I think, uh, turned me into a, primarily, because this is what people say now that you have, uh, you, have uh, you are primarily a person who is a student of violence. Because even my work on the future, even my work on uh, uh, Indian politics has been tinged by my experience with violence. It was a pleasure meeting the group which David set up. Uh, I learned a lot from that. But I also saw that uh, violence is a subject which is very uncomfortable to many people. I think many of the uh, things we are now reading or seeing or hearing of goes against our old ideas of violence. Violence and nonviolence are not equally balanced in human nature. It is, uh, in, in fact, and I was quite impressed by a journalist's book on uh, war. Uh, this is why I, I think, I, if I remember the name correctly, it is Gwain Dyer. David might have read it. Uh, Gwain Dyer, War, a Lethal Custom. She is a historian, though part, partly historian, because she's a journalist mainly, uh, who comes to the conclusion after looking at archaeological findings and other details, that war was institutionalized in the lifestyle of communities centuries after this community came into existence. It was not something with which the communities were born with or human beings were born with. Um, likewise, there is this uh, interesting book by a person who teaches in uh, one of the America, one of America's war colleges, I think they call them, Dave, Dave Grossman. And he shows how difficult it is to teach the, the cadets uh, to learn to kill. And even when they get, get a little chance, a little leeway, they try to avoid that responsibility of killing. Very, very important book. Hmm. Um, yeah. So there is now a different kind of consciousness that is emerging, which we have underestimated till now. Unfortunately, waves of this, this uh, consciousness has not spread out in the world equally. It has been circulating partly in the academic circles, partly in the knowledge systems, but not in the way we think and institutionalize uh, our, um, our lifestyle, our organizations, and we are caught 
in a system which even the pacifists have to make some space for. The difference budgets of some of the poor countries remains astronomically high. Even though they have no enemies, I find countries which are no, have no enemies are trying to find enemies to hold their own population together. They feel that creating enemy, enemies uh, will give them a, a public uh, backing which they do not have otherwise. I've seen this in um, a number of countries. Ashi, okay. hmm. can I interrupt you for a story about that? Hmm. Uh, and then I come back to where you are, okay? Hmm. Uh, you know, when uh, Gorbachev met with President Reagan of the United States mm. to have a treaty mm. for uh, against uh, the missiles and uh, weapons. Mm. He told uh, Reagan, mm. I'm going to do something terrible. I'm going to remove your enemy so you will not have an enemy. Mm. And there was panic in Washington. <laughs> and so they engaged a Harvard professor who was working with the CIA named Ham Samuel Huntington mm. to find a new enemy. Mm. And so he published his very famous study. Mm. Uh, what was the name of it? You, you know. Clash uh, of Civilizations. That's the one, yeah. The Clash what, of Civilizations. Come in, please. The Clash of Civilizations. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, and yes. that was to find the new enemy. Mm. And the new enemy was Islam. Mm. So then they could continue to justify the militarism of the United States. But anyway, back to what you were saying. Yes. I see this in India today. You know, this, uh, people talk of the East Asian Tigers. I have seen how oh, from the time of Sigmund Rhee in 1950s in Korea to Chiang Kai-shek and his son in Taiwan, to Marcos and his wife in Philippines, to Singman Ri in Singapore, not Singapore, uh, in uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore. Uh, uh, one by one, all historical countries began to uh, open their economies and also began to become authoritarian. Um, and there is a term for it used by a friend of mine from in Australia, uh, which I have found very appropriate. Um, uh, repressive developmental regimes. Because the idea of development and opening up the country to free economy gave them a license, which they fully used by establishing authoritarian regimes. And this so-called East Asian tigers were all man eaters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in the sense that they were extremely destructive. And that is a disease which has now entered South Asia too. About, you know, Sri Lanka, which was being hailed as a country which has opted out of the third world, which has one of the healthiest economies as well as healthiest social welfare system, dreamt of becoming like Singapore and prosperous and rich. In the process, they either became richer, they became poorer because they had started a civil war, uh, formed an enemy in the local Tamils, um, and the, uh, for the last uh, 30 years, they are trying to live with that their violent present. And somehow, uh, they, are, they are no longer where they were. They destroyed that uh, whole civic culture in the process of trying to be rich quickly. Mm. Now, that same thing has entered into Pakistan, and now in India, after injuring the world's largest, as world's most powerful 
um, democracy. Now the virus has reached Indian democracy. And we have to fight the state's increasing bent towards an authoritarian regime. Was there internal conflict in the group that gathered in Seville on the question of violence? Professor Adams, maybe you would like to elaborate on that. Uh, and if you could, for the benefit of our listeners, just uh, you know, give us a, a, a brief overview of what the civil statement said and why it was so significant, because uh, you were all swimming against the tide. The dominant idea at that time was that violence is the dominant characteristic of our species. So what gave you all the wisdom and the courage to swim against that current? Well, uh, first of all, the uh, Seville statement was a scientific statement. And uh, the three of us who worked all night, myself, uh, well, I was a, a physical scientist, but uh, we were social scientists primarily, uh, Ashis and, and uh, Santiago. But uh, we had invited to Seville the foremost expert on animal behavior, a man named uh, John Paul Scott. Mm. And uh, we also invited one of the foremost- oh, oh, This is British, uh, 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 British intercessor. Was he? John Fox? John, John, John Paul Scott. Oh. And he was uh, uh, from the United States. United States, okay. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. And, uh, and we also invited a very, very prominent expert in genetics named Benson Ginsberg. Oh, yes. Also from the United States. Hmm. And they uh, gave us very clear information about the evolution of behavior and about the genetics of behavior. And uh, we were able to base this, the civil statement on that saying that there is no basis in genetics for war mm -hmm. and there is no basis in our behavior mm -hmm. that we have inherited as animals for war. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, gave us a scientific basis. Mm. But of course, we could not avoid being somewhat political. And so uh, Ashis and uh, Santiago uh, insisted, coming from Mexico and India, that we address genocide and colonialism. Mm. And we included, for that reason, we, we proposed to include a paragraph which they wrote and I'm going to read it for you now because it's the way it came out in the final version. Please. It's the second paragraph of the Seville statement. Mm -hmm. The misuse of scientific theories and data mm -hmm. to justify violence mm -hmm. and war is not new, but has been made since the advent of modern science. Mm -hmm. For example, the theory of evolution has been used to justify not only war, but also genocide, colonialism, and suppression of the weak. Mm. So this paragraph, we came back from our work all night and proposed that to the group. And I remember Benson Ginsburg stood up and he said, I cannot accept that. Uh, we cannot that? say that, that's too political, and I'm leaving. Who is this? Benson Ginsburg, the geneticist. Mm. And, uh, so that was a, took me all day to work with him and to convince him to stay and to contribute to the very important genetic component of our work uh, and to accept that he had to accept that we had to be at least a little bit political in the statement. We could not, it was a scientific statement, but we could not avoid this, this political aspect. Uh, and finally he stayed and then the others stayed also. So we, we didn't lose anybody over that. Okay. And what was the reception? Uh, what reception did the civil statement get among the both academic and, uh, and scholarly community? 
at that time because that uh, is a, a, a kind of a more important issue uh, within the academic world. How was the civil statement received before we get into how politically it has or has not been taken seriously over the last 35 years? Well, uh, Rajni, I'm going to address both academia and also the media. Please, together. please. The civil statement, we, we worked very hard in the United States with a number of colleagues and eventually the civil statement was formally endorsed by the three largest social science organizations of the United States. The first was the American Anthropological Association where a young anthropologist named Douglas Fry was very active and he got an endorsement from them. The second was the American Psychological Association. And since I was a professor of psychology, I was very active in, in uh, all of the work to get that endorsement. And it was endorsed then by the American Psychological Association and later by the American Sociological Association. So much for the good news. Now the bad news. When the American Psychological Association endorsed the Seville Statement, we held a press conference to invite the media to talk about it. And I was the person to telephone the media for the press conference. I remember calling Associated Press, which is one of the big agencies, and they said, oh, what you are saying is not interesting to us. But when you do find a gene for war, call us back and we'll come. And uh, the other media were the same. And the most remarkable was Science Magazine, which is the most important magazine for science in the world. They refused to, to publish our press release. And so we got the presidents of the three associations that had uh, endorsed the civil statement to write a letter to the editor, to Science Magazine. Now, Science Magazine formally is the property of these associations. But it refused to publish the letter. Why did they refuse to publish it? Now, I, I, someday we will open the files of the Central Intelligence Agency the way the files of the KGB were opened after the fall of the Soviet Union. And what we will find is that there was a CIA agent in Science Magazine who was responsible for censorship. Now that's, I cannot prove that because I don't have the, uh, I don't have the files of the CIA. But we know uh, from the uh, uh, hearings of the United States Senate, the church hearings at that time, that the CIA put its agents in every major media. That was, uh, and, and so Science Magazine was a major media. And so I assume that there was an agent there also. But these are things we cannot prove. We don't have any proof. We can only suppose that that was the reason why they refused. But in any case, to refuse to publish a letter to the editor from your own uh, agent, your own uh, associations is quite remarkable. It is, it is. Was there opposition from within academia? Was yes, there of challenge? In, of course, in the, the three associations, there were challenges, but the challenges were minority and the majority supported the, the civil statement. Okay. Okay. Ashisa, would you like to add anything here? No, except that this statement didn't much, uh, get much of a run in countries like India, China, and even, I would say, whole of South Asia, and perhaps even Southeast Asia, because often I have asked about whether they have seen this. And in most cases, they said no. And even if they have seen it, they don't acknowledge its significance. Because I have a feeling that there is a belief that for the formerly colonial countries, 
there is a deep suspicion of anything which in the absence of a better expression i will call demasculinization by the uh, more pro prosperous countries and they feel that this uh, attempt is actually an uh, call to passivity and uh, carelessness about the defense of the country yeah, in, in, in uh, less politely they think these these are um, these are technologies of treachery as, as they will go as far as that i'm sorry treachery <laughs> treachery by the imperial forces no no not ha huh, yeah that, that, that gets from um, some of the academics are promoting this but by their own citizens academics who are uh, supporting this uh, professor adams you were saying something uh, no I, i was just trying to understand now i understand that, that yeah uh, yeah i think that i, I think that, that was a, a problem well it was somewhat overcome by the fact that unesco then endorsed the statement hmm. uh, be, and that was useful because one of the signatories was a scientist named federico mayor zaragoza and one year after the civil statement he became the director general of unesco hmm. and in that way unesco endorsed the statement and uh, which led to the culture of peace program and the culture of peace program was very successful in india not in china but in india hmm. thanks to brahma kumaris oh. and uh, hmm. there were uh, something like 30 million signatures in india on the manifesto 2000 Well, it was the organization Brahma Kumaris. Brahma Kumaris. Ah, Brahma Kumaris. Okay. Yeah, they they uh, they collected signatures throughout India mm -hmm. on the manifesto. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, the peace program manifesto. Was an echo of the civil statement? Am I correct? In, in uh, indirectly, yes. In uh, not directly, but indirectly, yes. Because. Uh, uh, It was because of this bill statement that I went to UNESCO and when I was at UNESCO I proposed the culture of peace program and then we became that became the the program that had the manifesto and so forth. Okay. okay. I want to just go back to the point that uh, Ashish da raised towards uh, the end of his uh, last intervention. Uh that reminded me that on the ground we know that many groups that uh reject nonviolence by calling it cowardice mm. also uh, see it as uh, uh, emasculating because it is violence that is seen to be uh, well as ram guha said in his uh, ahimsa conversation that violence is always projected as uh, both masculine and macho and that is deemed to be desirable so mm. in what ways do you feel the last in 35 years since the civil statement where have we come on this issue um because i know that it's a mixed story despite the rise of terrorism etc i have a feeling that it's a mixed story but i i'm very keen to hear how both of you see this question well who goes first <laughs> go ahead professor adams well i think mm -hmm. there is more consciousness today that we need a culture of peace instead of a culture of war more than ever before in history i think and uh it is becoming it has become more difficult for yes. countries to have the culture of war they have to hide what they are doing behind secrecy and uh and of uh, false uh, uh literally of uh, false propaganda for example before making the war on iraq or before making the war on vietnam they had to have a, a false attack in the gulf of tonkin in order to justify going to war the attack didn't take place but they claimed it 
and that used that as the basis for going to war. They had to have some excuse. And in Iraq, it was the so-called weapons of mass destruction. In, in Syria, it was the so-called chemical attacks, which actually they made themselves, but they blamed on the Syrian government. Uh, and so, and now with China, they're in, they are largely inventing this uh, human rights abuses in uh, Mongolia, uh, or Xinjiang, how, how, you, how you pronounce it, I'm not sure. That, and as, a, as an excuse to have a, a war with China. They, because the people don't want war. And uh, so it, it, they have to have, well, that's why people like Julian Assange uh, are such heroes because they expose the secrets of the culture of war. Mm -hmm. And now the culture of war relies on secrecy and false information. So in that sense, we've made progress that I think that the, the, uh, the culture of war is, has to hide itself, but it's still in power. And uh, what we need is a radical institutional change in global governance. Now, uh, because for example, the United Nations Security Council is, is dominated by all the nuclear powers not all the nuclear powers because India and Pakistan are not uh, dominant, but uh, the UK, France, the United States, China, and Russia, they're the, the main nuclear powers and they run the UN Security Council. As long as that is the case, we cannot have a culture of peace. What we need is a radical change in global governance. Now, some people might think that's impossible, but I think it's possible and I'll tell you why because I think that the culture of war is very unstable and very precarious. And the reason I say that is from my experience of living in the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 80s and watching an empire crash from inside. And I see the same, the same thing happening now to the American empire. It's going to crash for the same reasons that the Soviet empire crashed. It's not supportable. In the United States now, there is no money for education or health care. All the money goes to the military. And the United States has hundreds of military bases around the world that are all vulnerable and are draining the American dollar. The dollar will crash. And when the dollar crashes, the American empire will crash and there will be a window of opportunity for something completely new, which is what we are working on. Uh, there is a new declaration, and if I have time, I can give you the, the reference for the new declaration. Please do. Which calls for, uh, which calls for this kind of a, a change in global governance. What is this declaration called, Professor Adams? It's the Declaration for the Transition to a Culture of Peace in the 21st Century. Okay. And uh, I'll tell you what I want to, I can put the reference on the, uh, the chat here. Thank you, thank you. So while what you say is of course completely true, at the same time in everyday life, uh, certainly this is the situation in India, I suspect it is there in many societies, we are seeing a rise in day-to-day -day violence. Uh, it, in India, it has taken the form of random lynchings, and uh, kind of vigilante uh, attacks in you know small of small groups attacking unarmed and vulnerable people, um, and uh, sometimes uh, the most disturbing thing is not that the attack happened, but that it garnered a kind of approval uh, by ordinary people who were not themselves perpetrating the violence, but seemed to stand back and uh, approve of it. So Ashishta, what is your reading on this front? Um, have, have things become worse or uh, are we, uh, am I not understanding what is happening here? No, it certainly has become worse. Everybody knows that India is now the world capital on lynch. Not that many lynchings are taking place now, but nonetheless it is the fact that it is the only country where lynching is alive. Uh, America used to be the lynching capital of the world till 1950s. But at the moment, India is. 
likewise india is uh, the world champion as far as accusation of uh, um, uh, crimes under the national security act is the highest even if you quarrel with your wife and you are a politician and somebody wants to fix you the, the opposition he might file a suit against you uh, um uh, for threatening india security it is, is it has become a casual um, um, act the courts are resisting this but as yet it remains a country at war with itself and i don't see even the idea of idea of peace as a distant goal going very far the present regime is a direct in the direct lineage of the assassination of gandhi that took place uh, nearly 75 years ago and though gandhi still remains the most popular india according to all surveys available but i i have also seen a new hostility to the to gandhi and his ideas and and a widespread feeling increasingly uh, widespread feeling that non violence is a technology of the weak you know Um, everybody has forgotten gandhi's feeling that the, the truly brave are non violent sorry ajay sir can you just repeat that last point the truly brave uh, you know uh, brave are the, the non violent uh, and that uh, that is seen as something uh, part of gandhi's androgyny so to speak mm. uh, and uh, you know no, don't forget that gandhi claimed that the best non violent resistance against the british was shown by the afghans the pathans that pathans had fought in four afghan wars with the british and were undefeated by the british and yet at gandhi's call they joined the non violent struggle and nobody lifted even a stick to hit back so that was true true courage and true bravery and true masculinity yeah yeah but do you see signs see because if we are to go by the insights of the civil statement and much other work that uh, has been done in this sphere then it follows that uh, there should be and perhaps there is a response by ordinary people uh, who find the violence unbearable is it that this response is not finding a politically viable articulation or that uh, it is subdued in some way that uh, if you can mobilize your constituency your supporters in a particular way hatred can go very far let us not let us not forget that part of the story hatred is a very powerful motive too and once you have planted the seeds of hatred once you have declared a community as your enemies then automatically automatically its infection spreads i mean um uh, i met these two psychiatrists who had studied the bosnian violence and they said that one of their clients a doctor said what is this difference there was no difference people intermarried freely people interacted freely and the muslims and the serbians for instance it is a few ultra nationalist serbians who glorified 
the minor differences that they had here and there and build them up and drummed up hatred against the Muslims. So don't talk of it. Don't talk, teach us multiculturalism or tolerance. We were a tolerant multicultural uh, entity. We, we are living together for centuries. And here is, in a, here is are a few people, few fanatics who created a huge wave of hatred. And I think that, that, the, that the generation of that hatred has become much more possible because of the way media has changed and the way the states now have begun to enter that world in many, many countries. Uh, I mean, much of the authoritarian states have the full control over the media first. And because they make certain voices not officially silent, but unofficially silent. Uh, Ashish, may I add something to the Bosnian story? Hmm. Please. The, uh, the, the events that you uh, talk about, hmm. in which uh, a few Serbians were able to mobilize hatred against the Muslims, this came within a political historical context when the West decided to dismember mm. Yugoslavia because mm. Yugoslavia was a socialist mm. country mm. Uh, and not uh, compatible with the capitalist intentions mm -hmm. of, of the Americans and the Europeans. Mm. And so plane loads of guns were shipped into Bosnia and uh, various components of Yugoslavia mm. in order to launch a civil war. Mm. So that this hatred against the Muslims came within a context of warfare that was sponsored by NATO, mm. the United States and its allies in, in Europe. And we, we can see uh, scientifically, that when a country is engaged in the war, the individuals become more aggressive also. Yes. And it's, it, but the cause is political. The, mm. the, the ultimate cause is political. Mm. And the result then is the hatred among individuals. Mm. But that's not the cause. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But you know, in, in, in case of both um, Palestine and India, Pakistan, if you look at this, at the same time they started their journey in 1947-48. And still now, the violence goes on. Uh, it shows somehow a certain persistence of violence, even in countries which require at least a respite from violence. Both the Israeli community, as a community, not as a state, but as a community of Israelis require and would, I'm sure they would, would, would have wanted to live in peace. And India too, and Saudi Pakistan too, that we have had enough violence already. But that is, has become something, now, now they have linked it, that peace, to the fact that you are heavily armed and constantly you stare, staring in each other um, with the violence in mind. Same thing is happening now gradually about India-China relations, border, the border. I mean, I have a feeling that in both countries, this is a way of controlling the population. Controlling the population in the uh, keeping them on the side of the regimes. Well, I, I, have to, I have to add. I have to add another uh, another ingredient to this uh, to this analysis. Mm. Uh, when I left UNESCO, and uh, the culture peace program was destroyed, uh, 
explicitly destroyed in order to avoid the possibility of peace, mm -hmm. I undertook uh, studies which led to my book called The History of the Culture of War. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the major conclusion of the history of the culture of war is that over the centuries, the nation state has come to monopolize the culture of war. Mm -hmm. It's not possible anymore for cities to make war or for indigenous tribes to make war mm -hmm. because it's only the state has the right to make war. But that is the fundamental right of the state is the right to make war. Mm -hmm. And the worst comes when, you, when the state adopts religion. When you have a state religion, then it becomes the, the worst possible culture of war. And that's the case in Israel, and it's becoming the case in the United States and India also. Mm. And this is the danger. When religion becomes combined with the culture of war of the state, uh, in other cases, Iran, you have a disaster. Mm. How in this context do we look at Rwanda then? because it was a very similar situation to mm. the one in Bosnia in that people couldn't even tell each other apart. And yet, uh, and I'm, I, 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 please do say if there was a geopolitical uh, dimension to the genocide in Rwanda, as we know there was in Bosnia, but um, how do we, you know, grapple with this kind of, uh, can we call it a temporary descent into insanity? Not even well, descent into anarchy. It is descent into do something sub subhuman. It yes. To their own wives. Yes. If they belong to the other community. Yeah. Case in Rwanda. <coughs> the case in Rwanda was the, the basis was laid by <coughs> colonialism, and colonialism divided the Tutsi and Hutu in order to uh, uh, to. Uh, dominate by, by, by division. And they, uh, the uh, colonial powers gave all the prominent positions to the Tutsi, and which laid the basis. Because before uh, colonialism, there was not a division of, of Hutu and T Tutsi. That was a colonial invention. And also, the church played a role in that the, uh, uh, in, the, in the colonial times. And uh, it was the, the, the basis was laid through colonialism. Yeah, but Professor Adams, at the same time, we know that uh, in the past, in the say 5,000 years that we are able to know to some extent, uh, there has been tribal conflict. Okay, we do have the Mahabharata in India, I'm, I'm, you know, which is a war between cousins. But uh, uh, so how should we, reconcile this historical reality with the observations that you all made in the civil declaration. That it is simultaneously true then that um, we have a longing for peace and nonviolence, and yet we fall into these uh, dark spaces. So what is this dynamic? Well, uh... There is such a dynamic, but it's not uh, inevitable. For example, when we, when we uh, developed the Culture of Peace program at UNESCO, we intervened in Mozambique and El Salvador after the civil wars in those countries. And you had a million people killed in each case or fle fleeing the country in each case. And we, we said to the ex-enemies, if you will work together, we will fund projects for you to work together in, in education and science and culture and communication. And we were able to get the, it, it took us years to do, but we were able to get the enemies who had been killing each other to work together. That's possible. But the problem was that once the projects were designed, the main nation states, the United States and the European allies and Japan refused to uh, fund these projects because they don't want peace. And if you had a, a United Nations which really worked for peace, you could, you could uh, reconcile these conflicts 
that have been going on for thousands of years. They're, they're reconcilable, but it requires the political will and the infrastructures, national and international infrastructures, who want that to take place. Ashishnat, would you like to add something here? Yes, I would like to add only this thing that for the moment, I think if you look at the map of the world, it's rather, there are reasons to be pessimistic. This is what David, in fact, is indirectly saying. You know, but I also suspect that human beings cannot be permanently kept in ignorance of facts. That ultimately everything said, there are ways of reaching out to the people. And there are instances of where nonviolence has worked, even in states which we never thought would bend to nonviolence. There is only one case or one instance where Nazi Germany confronted a nonviolence demonstration. And in a book which describes this thing, it's called the Rosenstrasse Kines. They talk, mention also the conversation amongst the Nazi leaders. And there were suggestions that they should machine gun these German women who were, were, were flooding the chancellery. Yeah, and they were offering a kind of satyagraha, actually. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's exactly the case. And then they, it dawned on them that that will antagonize the entire German people. And they decided to uh, make compromise with them, release their husbands. In many cases, Jewish husbands, too. So nonviolence can also work. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a matter of your patience versus their impatience. That's a very important point. Ms. Adams, do you want to add something to that? Well, I, I just would add to the word patience. Uh, when I sign off on a letter now, I say peace through struggle and patience. Upon coming in with peace, a struggle and Peace through struggle and patience. Peace through struggle. Yes. So before, uh, by way of closing this session, uh, can I request both of you to share uh, your advice for young people? I, I always ask for advice. See, because I meet a lot of young people who are instinctively drawn towards nonviolence, but they look at the world that we are in at the moment and, and they feel daunted. So what are some of both the inner resources and, uh, you know, the historical and scientific basis uh, which can give them, which, you know, which can light their path? Well, I will come back to struggle and patience. Our young people, they should struggle for justice and they should be patient because the world is changing. You won't know it from the newspapers. You won't know it from the television. In fact, there was a very famous jazz singer who, whose song was, the revolution will not be televised. Well, the, the, the great changes that are coming to the world will not be televised, but they are coming. I'm convinced that the world is changing that the culture of war has, is coming to an end. It's, it's, it's days, it's going to crash. And at that point, it's going to be in the hands of young people and their struggle. Thank That's you. That's very nicely said. Um, Ashishta? Well, I suspect, to me it seems that the real enemy has been social Darwinism. We are brought up and socialized into social Darwinism in various forms. Um, uh, starting from Marx, uh, Marx um, dedicated 
dedicating the capital to Darwin himself. But this transfer of it into human affairs in general was a, as a dangerous thing. There is a correspondence between Marx and Engels, which is very leveling. Engels informs him that Algeria has fallen and French have occupied Algeria and colonized it. Marx writes replies that good, now they will get civilized. I think that idea of civilizing that through warfare, through colonialism, they're spreading civilization, <coughs> sending actually a message of peace. We were told this even during this, both the world wars, that after this, peace will reign for at least a century. It didn't happen that way. I mean, already after the second world war, we have had at least 75 wars, small wars. It hasn't happened that way. This evolutionism, social evolutionism, is a danger which we must exile from academic work. But we in what ways, uh, Ashisa, in what ways can I, I, young I, people... I, I, Go I, ahead, John. I just, Go want ahead, to, I just want to pick up on what Ashi said about civilization. Please. And I think I'm correct to quote uh, Mahatma Gandhi when he was asked about civilization. Mm. And he said, Yes, it would be a good idea. <laughs> yeah. So Ashishta, I was going to request that what you said just now, uh, can you, Ashishta, say how this would apply in the everyday life of young people? I mean, I don't mean literally every day, but in what ways can young people build on this wisdom? This uh, about the oh. rejecting... This the is very social Darwinism. Because they are constantly hearing how competition is good. Unalloyed competition. Our ruthlessness is better in the corporate world. That if you want to succeed in life, you have that, have have that ruthlessness. It is not only in that uh, domain of economy. It is uh, now percolated in, even in sports. Now, how many medals you can win? How? I know. Even playing, there's no element of play in sports because sport has become corporatized. Yeah. Uh, so in this corporatized world, I think we have to fight by trying to at least leave some domains open for other kinds of things to go and enter the picture. I mean, if there is no element of play in sports, if sports has become a profession and people take pride in saying that so-and-so is an excellent professional, a perfect professional, ideal professional, it's, it's a very sad uh, comment on that spot for sports. You know. uh, well, a, a British activist friend, uh, Peter Shalon, hmm. uh, once said to me that uh, the word amateur hmm original meaning is the lover of intrinsic value. The lover of intrinsic value? Yes. Oh, lovely, yes. Because the root word is amor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, any closing thoughts from both of you before we, before I thank you again? I, 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 I want very much to thank you, Rajni, for bringing Ashish and me together. Mm -hmm. It's been... It's been an honor. It's been way too long that we have mm. not been in working together, Ashish. Absolutely, absolutely. I think, mm. I think we still have work to do. Mm. Yes, uh, very right. Yeah. So I, I, I hope that this meeting is the beginning of more work together and we'll include you too, Rajni. Mm -hmm. yeah. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> I will yeah. look forward to that. So do I. Yes, yes. So Thank I. you so much. Namaste and all the best and a big heartfelt thanks to both of you. We enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.